Good evening, everyone. How are we all this evening? Are we all excited? How about this? We've got some world-class conversation about to happen tonight. I'm very, very excited to introduce you. Before we do that, I'd like to acknowledge the um, custodians of the land which we uh, gathered today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And to pay our respect to Elders past, present and emerging. Uh, one of the things I very much enjoy about that statement is that the Indigenous people had a very important place for gatherings, not just social, but to share important messages. And tonight is no difference with Dr. Trinova coming uh, all the way from the United States. So uh, welcome, welcome. Um, it's, it's a great thrill to be back. This is actually the 12th annual um, Graham Clark oration. It's the first one since 2019. So it's been a three-year hiatus, and this is rather an occasion, I think. It's, it's wonderful to see Melbournians out and about again, enjoying some of the uh, sunshine that has been around. It's still not quite warm, but I'll take the sunshine. And uh, being uh, open to, to, to gatherings such, as, uh, such important uh, events as tonight. Uh, I wanted to thank the incredible support and belief in this very special public event uh, in honour of the, one of the country's greatest medical heroes. Uh, regretfully, though, I must inform that professional, Professor Graham Clark is unable to be with us this evening. Uh, he's deeply disappointed. And, uh, however, he'd like to share a short video. I am looking forward to Professor Natalia Treyanova's visit in learning about her research to predict heart disease using digital twins. Professor Treyanova's research is creating a new frontier in cardiology with precision medicine that provides therapy tailored to each patient and that gives us the potential to predict the onset of heart disease, prevent it and treat it. I have loved too the presence of secondary school children and hope they will have been inspired to be our future scientists. The oration has had numerous highlights. It has always had a real sense of occasion leading to the expectation that something important is about to unfold and one is never disappointed. I might quit quickly introduce myself. My name's John Yeo, I'm your MC for this evening. I'm mostly known to be the uh, licensee and curator for TEDx Melbourne. So I have the fortunate gift of being working with some of the smartest and brightest people in the country and sharing their message to the rest of the world. I'm extremely proud by what Australians are able to produce both locally and also have that impact internationally. And um, it, it, is, it is a real honor to be part of that role. Um, we're in for a real treat tonight, though. Uh, we have this astonishing science story to share with you, reminding us how biomedical research is moving fast and reshaping healthcare. And if you want to tweet or share what we have in, in terms of tonight's proceedings, the hashtag and, and the handle is up on screen there. So uh, feel free to share this with the rest of the world. Let them know what they're really missing out on. It's going to be a great night. I would like to actually invite the former Treasurer and Premier of Victoria, the Chancellor of La Trobe University and the Chair of the Convention Centre Trust, the Honourable John Brumby, to introduce this year's orator. Well, thank you very much uh, to, uh, to John, our MC tonight. Uh, as Chair of the Melbourne Convention Exhibition Trust, can I firstly welcome everybody to this magnificent space tonight and also add my acknowledgement of the traditional owners of the land and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. Uh, it's a very great honour for me tonight to, uh, to have the opportunity to introduce Professor Tryanova this evening to deliver the Graham Clark oration. In Australia and around the world, biomedical research is exploding. It's driven by the bringing together of uh, disciplines ranging from the life sciences right through to the physical sciences, to engineering, computer science, and importantly, to data science. And we see this in so many ways, uh, in the sequencing of the human genome, in nanotechnology-based therapies, in new imaging technology that can shed light on the functioning of cells and organs. We see it in regenerative medicine enabling organ replacement, the development of new vaccines, 
and of course the continued growth of bionics. These uh, interdisciplinary efforts are powerfully accelerating the discovery, the management and the treatment of diseases. And of course, for those of us who aren't scientists in this place, we, we see this most clearly in the therapeutics, where personalised approaches are becoming more and more accessible every day. And that's why it's so exciting to have Professor Trianova to speak to us this evening in Melbourne, of course, Australia's biomedical powerhouse and a long-standing global leader in medical research. And I know that uh, so many of the people present tonight for the Graham Clark Lecture for the Eurasian have helped contribute to Melbourne's leadership position. Melbourne-based companies now make up more than 40% of Australia's listed health technology firms. Our medical research institutes receive more than 40% of Commonwealth Government funding. And of course, our universities and our medical research institutes are globally recognised. And just this year, for example, you would have seen that Monash University was ranked number one in the world in the QS World University rankings for pharmacy and pharmacology. So I'd like to welcome Professor Treanova uh, to Australia's medical technology capital. Um, she is a trailblazer when it comes to personalised medicine. She is the Murray Sachs Professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at Johns Hopkins University, a Professor of Medicine at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, and she directs the Alliance for Cardiovascular Diagnostic and Treatment Innovation. She is the primary innovator in the use of modern computation and modelling approaches in cardiac arrhythmia research and in the diagnosis and treatment of patients with heart rhythm disorders. Her translational research has enabled the construction of digital models of human hearts or digital twins, as you heard Graham talking about, that realistically represent the functioning of the diseased organ. Dr. Trianova has applied artificial intelligence methods for predicting who is at risk of cardiac arrest and cardiac death. This approach of going beyond a reliance on visual diagnosis is having a profound influence on clinical decision making and the delivery of patient care. So we are all eager tonight to hear more about this astonishing story. Dr. Trianova is currently conducting a clinical trial approved by the US Food and Drug Administration in simulation-driven treatment for cardiac arrhythmias. This is the first time that the FDA has approved a clinical trial in which heart treatment is driven by computer simulations. So it is therefore my very great pleasure to invite Dr. Natalia Trianova, a pioneer, a revolutionary, and an innovator to deliver the Bionics Institute 2022 Graham Clark Oration. Thank you, Dr. John Brumby, for introducing me. Welcome. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here. I can't tell you how delighted I am to be here in this wonderful city. It's such an honor for me to be giving the oration. It is also absolutely marvelous to see people in person. This is the first time I'm wearing heels in two years, so it's going to be a bit of a different experience, but there is nothing that substitutes the experience being in person, so it gives me the energy of the audience. Um, to be with you tonight. I'm deeply grateful to, the, to Professor Graham Clark and to the Bionics Institute for the invitation and to Luan Ismail, wherever you are, Luan, who organized every little detail perfectly of my visit. I'm really sorry um, Professor Clark cannot be here tonight, but I wanted to share with you um, how deeply honored I am to be giving the oration in his name. So today I want to talk to you about, here is my title, Engineering Your Heart's Health. I want to take you on a journey of two engineering approaches. The first is Digital Twin, as you already heard. So Digital Twin is basically a replica 
of something physical, of a physical entity. It's a computer model of, of the thing. But what is important is that it doesn't just incorporate the components, but also the interactions, the dynamic interactions between them. And it's an approach that has been used a lot of industry for optimizing the performance of machinery and manufacturing processes. In healthcare, um, it is beginning to be used, and we believe that it will enable these continuously adjusting personalized models of patients or organs. And that's what I want to talk to you uh, today. As you heard, we create these digital twins of the patient's hearts to be used in treatment, diagnosis, or predicting the trajectory of the patient with heart disease. The other approach that I will be showing you today is artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence has, is ubiquitous these days. Um, machine learning, which is part of artificial intelligence, basically analyzes data and finds patterns in the data and makes inferences. So in my work, uh, we use digital twin technology and also artificial intelligence separately, but also often we combine them synergistically. And this enhances the approaches that we are using in personalized medicine, as I hope to convince you. So here is a heart. The heart, the purpose of a heart is to pump blood so oxygen is delivered to every part of our body. For each beat of the heart, for each contraction, the contraction is preceded by an electrical wave that sweeps through the heart, a regular wave that is actually the trigger, electrical signal that's the trigger for contraction. And sometimes there can be a problem with the heart rhythm. We have disorders called arrhythmias. Since this is the trigger for the contraction, of course, if something wrong goes wrong with the heart rhythm, then there is a problem with the contraction, and it could be fatal. There are two types of arrhythmias that I will talk to you um, today about. The first is atrial, and the second is ventricular. They come from the name of the chambers in the heart. The lower chambers in the heart are called the ventricles, and the upper are the atria. So we have two different types of arrhythmias. Atrial arrhythmias actually are the most frequent arrhythmias in, a, in humans. Um, as a matter of fact, one to two percent of the worldwide population have this arrhythmia. It increases as we age dramatically, and also it's pretty dangerous. While in itself not being lethal, it leads to stroke, also to heart failure and mortality. The, um, I think it's about five million people in the US population actually have atrial, atrial arrhythmias, and particularly the most dangerous of it called atrial fibrillation. The ventricular arrhythmias are less frequent, but they are little in themselves. So if we have an arrhythmia in the ventricles, if it occurs, most that's what is called a cardiac arrest. Cardiac arrests are pretty much due entirely to ventricular arrhythmia. And these are events that, sudden cardiac death or cardiac arrest, those are events that can occur unexpectedly and um, unfortunately, uh, many people die suddenly. So in the US, for instance, there are about 1,000 people per day that would die of sudden cardiac death. That's the statistics in, of the last years. In our work, oh, in our what I call clinical translation work, clinical translation I refer to as bringing engineering approaches to the clinic. In our work, we, we work in two important research avenues, uh, diagnostics and treatment. And in diagnostics, the most important is actually predicting this risk of sudden cardiac death or cardiac arrest. So I want to show you what we do in this respect. So let's, um, among the cardiac diseases, the, the survivors of a heart attack or infarct, they actually are at very high risk of sudden cardiac death. 
So infarct is when a blood vessel in the heart is blocked and part of the heart cannot get oxygen. So parts of the heart will die and we get scarring in the heart. So we have this distributed scarring and what ends up happening is the electrical wave, which normally will propagate, encounters this scar, gets bounces around, finds its way through it, and very often will come around on itself. So instead of having an orderly electrical wave that propagates through the heart and the heart contracts, we get these waves that can go in kind of random fashion, come back on itself, and each of these waves will cause a contraction of the piece of the heart through which it is propagating. So what ends up happening is, if you get that sort of uh, that ventricular arrhythmia, what happens is the heart stops contracting um, in a synchronous manner. Instead, the heart contracts, you can think of it as contracting like a bag of worms. It's quivering and blood cannot be pumped. So that's why it is so little, uh, so little the, this, um, uh, this arrhythmia. You can see this is an ECG. You can see how chaotic even the, the ECG becomes. So that leads basically to the fact that the blood cannot um, reach the body anymore. It's not pumped out. So how do you save a patient's life if, if this event happens? Defibrillators are the only devices that can do that. You, they are also ubiquitous. You have seen them in stadiums, at airports, in schools. Um, those are the external defibrillators that will deliver an electrical shock. If a patient is at high risk of sudden cardiac death, they will get a defibrillator implanted. The question, though, is how do you decide that the patient is at high risk so a defibrillator needs to be implanted? Currently, the decision by um, which a patient is deemed at high risk is made by one clinical parameter called ejection fraction. Ejection fraction is the amount of blood that is pumped out with every heartbeat. So in a normal human being, this is about 60, between 55 and 70 percent of the blood that's in the heart gets pumped out with each beat. If, this, if the ejection fraction gets less than 35%, the patient is deemed at high, high risk for sudden cardiac death. Now, the problem here is that ejection fraction is not an electrical parameter. It doesn't tell you anything about the arrhythmia. It just tells you it doesn't pump very well. But there might be other factors that lead to that. So making a decision on this, this it's a plumbing parameter, if you will. While arrhythmia is an electrical problem, and in, in other words, as if you have in the house an electrical problem, but you call the plumber to fix it. It's the same thing. Um, so when defibrillators are implanted based on that, for one person that really needs the defibrillator, truly needs it, because they would have an arrhythmia, 20 others get devices implanted and they do not derive benefit from them. Implanting the defibrillator is actually a, a pretty, you know, a lot of people will have um, inappropriate shocks, malfunctions, uh, infections and so forth, living, or psychological problem, living with a device that when it discharges feels like a horse is kicking you in the chest. That is not fun. So it is a very difficult decision, and um, it's very inaccurate. So as I said, about 20% maximum of all sudden cardiac deaths are captured by this. Plus, many, many patients live with these defibrillators. So we wanted to do better. We wanted to, to develop something that can be used in the clinic to predict who should have a defibrillator appropriately implanted. So what we did is we um, developed a, a digital twin of each patient's heart based mostly on imaging and other data. And then what we do is we take this digital heart, it's on the computer, and then you can poke and prod it with electrical signal to see whether it's prone to developing an arrhythmia. You can do that in a 
you know, flesh and blood heart. But we can do it on the computer. So we can figure out where arrhythmia occurs. And this way, we can predict. We are looking at the electrical propagation. So we can predict who has a risk of sudden cardiac death. So that's our approach. So how do we um, do that? So um, we called our approach VARP, Virtual Heart Arrhythmia Risk Prediction. And it was for patients who have survived infarction. Uh, what we do is, you see here a video, this is an MRI, MRI, and it's a contrast-enhanced MRI. You can see here, I hope you can, there is a little white thing in the patient, in the patient's heart, that's the infarct, okay? And so we reconstruct from the imaging, um, you can see here is the infarct, we reconstruct the geometry of the heart, here is the distribution of the infarct in yellow, and around it, you have this blue area, um, it is called gray zone because it's not very bright. What it represents is the sort of a, some cells have died, other cells have not. It's actually a very arrhythmogenic area. So we represent that as well. We create that and here you can see um, 32 personalized geometrical models of different patients. You can see they have different, very different distributions of the scarring. It just depends on what happened in this patient. So that what tells you is personalized approach is really important because it, they're very different in the different patients. Um, we also incorporate in our models the fact that the cells, um, the cells in, the, in the heart actually follow um, this pathway. My, it's a myofiber that exists in the heart, and we actually were able to image human hearts and determine how these fibers run. So we incorporate that also in the model. So we have this model that's geometric, and then we populate it with actually virtual cells at the almost cellular resolution. And each of these cells generates an electrical signal. They're connected to each other, and the signal propagates. And we represent also, as I said, the scar and the gray zone. So we had a clinical study of 41 patients. And th those are 32 of the patients. And you can see here, um, what I'm showing here is the actual arrhythmia in these patients. You can see here how the wave, instead of going through the heart, and then you have a pause, instead, I'm gonna go back um, and run this again so you can see that. The, the electrical wave feels like a tornado on the heart, recirculating. So that's a very dangerous situation. But all, these, all, these patients, all of them were deemed at a very high risk for sudden cardiac death. So they all got defibrillators implanted. Now you can see here, we predicted that these 10 did not need them. So these patients among the highest risk out of 32, 10 actually in our hands, we demonstrate they don't need them. They don't need them. And um, so this demonstrated the applicability of this approach. And then we did also statistics to compare to ejection fraction, which is the clinical parameter. This is our, um, this is our uh, technology. And you can see here, the only predictive among all of the, those are kind of um, imaging parameters, we are the only predictive technology in this, the only, predict, only good criterion that can predict whether the patient has a sudden cardiac death. And so I just want to point out this. We did this blindly. We didn't know these patients had or didn't have an arrhythmia, whether they were at high risk or not. All what we received is the clinical images. And from there, we were able to predict that. And when we finished, we were able to compare with what is um, what was the clinical outcome? Now, then we applied it for patients that are at low risk. Now, this is very important because sudden cardiac death can occur in patients that might be, by this criterion, deemed at low risk. So they come to the hospital, they are deemed at low risk, they go home, and many of them will, will die in the prime of their life. So you want to capture those that do not receive defibrillators but should, right? And the clinical criterion does not capture that. So we did studies to, um, to demonstrate that we, our technology also works for these patients. 
So this was the first big advancement that we did in predicting risk of sudden cardiac death. And then we, as I said, those were patients with infarction. And then we progressed and said, okay, let's, let's have the approach applied to more complex diseases. And so in order to do that, we decided that in addition to creating a digital twin of the patient's heart, it would be really great to use also a methodology to incorporate in this predictor uh, clinical data. And because there are other factors that might be risk. And so we wanted to incorporate that and we wanted um, to use that in a total um, machine learning algorithm. And so this is a synergistic combination of a digital twin technology and artificial intelligence. The disease that we applied that um, to is called cardiac circuidosis. It's um, uh, basically an inflammatory disease, has a genetic component. It's a complex disease. But what is important for it is that you can see this is a PET scan, positron emission tomography that shows the inflammation in the heart. So this patient has a large area of inflammation. And also this is on the contrast enhanced MRI. You can see the scar, fibrosis or scar. So these patients have not only scar, they also have inflammation in the heart. And so what we did is um, we actually created this fusion digital twin from two different imaging modalities. We have the PET scan and the MRI, the contrast enhanced MRI, and we created a model of these patients' hearts that, that represents not only the scarring distribution, but also the, the distribution of inflammation. And um, this is one patient heart. You can see there are different regions. They have the cells in these regions behave differently. And we had, for this um, study, we had 45 patients, and actually 36% um, of them had actual clinical arrhythmia, um, VTS, ventricular tachycardia. We didn't know that. We are again blind to all of that. So we are just given the scans, and we create these models. And um, so we create the model from these scans. We predict with the digital twin as before, which patients will have an arrhythmia. But then we don't stop here. We feed the outcome of these simulations together with other imaging and clinical data. We feed that in an artificial intelligence, in a machine learning algorithm, and we call that CHI. It's a computational heart plus artificial intelligence risk predictor. So this is a more complex, it's a synergistic approach of the two technologies that I'm talking about. And let me show you um, the results. They were only 45 patients, small cohort, but nonetheless excellent results. You can see here, um, we talk about the area under the receiver operating characteristic. You want this number to be closer to one and definitely above 0.5. So we had pretty good results in the cross-validation and test. And also we have very good balance between sensitivity and specificity in our predictor. So let me just show you what the same group of patients, the same cohort, if you judge it by presence of fibrosis, very low sensitivity, you can see here, uh, sorry, very low specificity. Ejection fraction, very low sensitivity. So none of these were good. None of the clinical um, criteria were really good. We were so much better than that. So this is another example, as I progress through that, of using the digital twin, now combined with artificial intelligence, to predict the risk of sudden cardiac death in a very complex disease. To just highlight the advantages once more, it is really based on the underlying mechanisms. We understand how these arrhythmia occurs. We can incorporate data from multiple modalities, and it's much better than what is currently done in the clinic. Now, I want to take you through our newest research, which was extremely exciting and received such a interest from the public. It was a, a study in which we um, predicted risk of sudden cardiac death not using the digital twin technology, but only AI. This was a deep learning from data to predict the risk of sudden cardiac death. And you can see this is a, it's a kind of, uh, this is the cover of our, uh, the cover of the journal with, with a, uh, a sort of an image that uh, for our paper, there is a little slice of the heart with a, with a neural network. Um, so in this study, 
what we did was, it, it's really a very, this is a very um, kind of brave new technology. It's very, uh, nobody has done that before in any form. What we did is, we did two neural networks. So the neural networks are like, networks like the brain. They learn from stuff, but we don't know exactly what they, how they learn. But um, we took all the images from the patients, and then we have a neural network that learns from these images. So the images have the scarring. Those are patients with infarction. They have the scarring. So the neural network learns from the images to find patterns. And also another neural network learns from the clinical data. And these two neural networks, we put them together in what's called a survival model. So we are able to predict not just you are at risk, you are not at risk. We wanted to predict over a long period of time whether these patients will have risk of sudden cardiac death. So by embedding that in a survival model, we, we create this probability distribution who is going to have, um, what is the time to sudden cardiac death? And we generate this individualized. Each patient has, it, um, has its own curve, survival curve, that tells you what's the probability of experience, experiencing a sudden cardiac death. And we did it over 10 years. Um, so we predicted up to um, 10 years. The most important innovation here is, well, in addition to embedding that in this um, survival analysis, is that we made the neural network learn from raw images. Images in the clinic are typically segmented. Somebody goes and draws and outlines the scar. Well, we were lazy to do that, so we used the neural network to learn directly from the raw, raw images, so we don't have to, you know, somebody doesn't have to sit there for hours to do that. And this is the first time nobody has done that before. So it was a lot of innovation um, in that. And most importantly, at the end, when we predict at what time a patient will have a sudden cardiac death, in the prediction, what we incorporate the level of uncertainty. And that uncertainty is also learned from the data. So um, here is our patient population for this artificial intelligence project. We had, those were, um, the patients were the internal cohort. What it means is internal cohort is, this is the group of patients on which you train your algorithm. So we trained our algorithm on a group of patients. They were from the hospitals in Maryland and Delaware, and they were all at high risk. They were patients with infarction. Now, if you want to really predict something that can be used in the clinic, you need to test it with what we call an external cohort, previously unseen patients. The algorithm has never seen those patients. And we took an algorithm, the external cohort, it was a different group of patients. They were not at, at uh, high risk. They were kind of medium risk. And these were 113 patients collected from 60 hospitals. So you can imagine all these images that we are using, they are from different scanners, different hospitals. So if the algorithm performs well, that's really great. So we are training on something, but testing on a different group of patients. So if the algorithm is really robust and good, this is called generalizable algorithm. So the issue of generalizability is very important for adopting um, artificial intelligence in clinical decision making. So this, you can see how varied was the patient group. So we did that, and the performance was excellent, actually. Um, what you see here is, again, this um, receiver operating characteristic. What's important is the value here. As I told you, we want that to be close to one. It's 0 0.87, and this is the average of prediction for 10 years ahead. 10 years ahead, um, and another, um, it's precision recalled, it's 0.93, very high, also has to be very close to one. So we were able to make a really excellent prediction in a very in innovative algorithm that, um, you know, nobody has ever thought of doing that before. Here are two patients. You can see the two different predictions. So this is the probability curve for one patient. We predicted that this patient will have uh, an event in about six years. 
and it indeed occurred very close to that prediction. So that was really good. Not always the, the patient-specific curve is that, um, you know, well-defined. We had some flatter cases. This is not a great prediction. I told you it carries the uncertainty in it. And here is the actual, um, the predicted time, and that's when the event occurred. So in some patients, we are not very certain. In others, we are very certain. That depends on the data for the, for the individual patient. Um, so why we think this is so awesome? Um, because it offers prediction up to 10 years. Um, it learns for the first time from raw images. And um, we generate entire probabilities um, over for time to sudden cardiac death. And we believe because it's generalizable, it can become a really personalized groundbreaking strategy for predicting risk of sudden cardiac death. So, I talked to you about diagnostics. Let's talk about treatment now. Treatment for arrhythmia. So I want to show you what we do for ablation guidance for atrial and ventricular arrhythmias. So what is that? So we're gonna use again, we'll start with the digital twin technology. So remember the, I described to you when you have scarring, how the wave, the wave bounces around and comes back on itself and you get that kind of you know, tornado looking thing, electrical storm on the heart. That's actually a medical term, electrical storm on the heart. Um, so the question is, how do you terminate that arrhythmia? Like, what do you do? So what they do in the clinic is they would thread a catheter um, in the heart and trying to find the place in the heart that is the perpetrator of arrhythmia. In other words, what they wanna do is, sorry, is to find these locations and they deliver burns there. So if they terminate, if they burn right here, they will terminate this recirculating arrhythmia. So antiarrhythmic drugs is one way to do it. Very few people want to be their entire life on antiarrhythmic drugs and they are not good. Um, they don't work very well. And so the question is, how can we find the best place where to deliver these burns, right? That's a massively important question. But it's a very difficult question. And so what I wanna show you today, how we determine where to ablate and how we guide the clinicians where to ablate in each patient, in real patients. We are there during the procedure and I'll show you that. So um, where do, to ablate is the big question. I want to start with atrial arrhythmias. Those were the one in the upper chambers that I told you they are not lethal, but they lead to stroke um, and have a lot of other, um, and a lot of people have them. They are huge healthcare expenditure. So finding a very good way to ablate patients is very important in that respect. So we're gonna talk about atrial arrhythmias. Why is it so hard to determine where to ablate? I told you, you have to find the, these places in the scarring where we can stop these uh, arrhythmias, these electrical waves from going around. Well, you look at this, these are patient atria. They have a lot of scarring, fibrosis. Look at that. Where would one find where to ablate, where to burn? Well, it can be anywhere because it's so distributed, right? That's why the, the, the problem with atrial fibrillation termination by ablation is really it, it's, very, it's very difficult because it's very difficult to find where to ablate. What happens is patients get ablated, then they, after three months or a year or a little bit more, they come back to the hospital. They are re-hospitalized. They are repeatedly ablated. I've seen patients, they are five times ablated, right? So if you predict correctly, they would not have to come back. Um, in addition, you deliver more and more lesions, you know, burned pieces of the heart. Well, the functioning of the atria is decreased, so you worsen the damage to the heart. Um, what I have here is a video of our simulation of one patient's atria, and you can see this chaotic electrical wave going around. So it's going around, many of them are, are moving around, so the question is where to ablate. It's actually, we found that there is one driver right here. You follow this pink thing? It's actually one wave. If you terminate 
the wave in this location, everything else quiets. So there is a driver, you know, because it, there is so much scarring, the waves go around like that, but if you find the driver and terminate that, then this will be very important. And it's a personalized approach to that. Um, so here is what we do. Um, so here is the concept. A patient comes, gets imaged, and again, this is a contrast-enhanced MRI, and it's a very difficult scan, actually, uh, because the wall of the atria are very thin, but we are able to reconstruct the fibrosis distribution, the scarring in, in this atria. And then we do the personalized simulations, and we find where is this location of that wave that's the driver, okay? We don't stop there, though. What we do is, we do, in the personalized model, we do a mock-up of the actual clinical procedure. We do a virtual ablation. We burn it in the model. We do that, perform the virtual ablation, and then we again give a little bit electrical stimuli to see, is that sufficient? Because sometimes, when you have a driver, you also have latent locations that could be drivers if you remove the first driver. So we repeat the procedure and then ablate and come back until we have this final optimal targeting where we know all the locations that could become drivers. And then we export that to the procedure room. In the procedure room, there is a machine. Uh, one type is called CARTO where that, that drives the catheter in the patient's heart. So what we do is we basically reverse engineered it and we are able to import our predictions. So in the procedure room, which I'm gonna show you right here, so a patient is right here, um, sedated of course, and there is a catheter in the heart and something like that is displayed on the screen. The physician sees is here, the physician is navigating the catheter in there in the procedure room, and they see our model and the targets. It's displayed. And so they go directly to where we predicted they should go. And they, they, I cannot tell you, it is like, it is actually really amazing. I'm not an MD. Um, my students, the people in my team are not MDs. We're all engineers. We are there, and then they are treating the patient, and they go, yeah, shall I do it? Yeah, do it. And it's like this sort of a amazing sense of responsibility, but also of, of I don't know, it's exhilarating, if you will. And it, it, it's to see my trainees being part of this process in which um, they make these clinical decisions, it's absolutely amazing. So um, it's, um, it's, it's an unbelievable experience. So that's, that's what happens. Um, so we did a prospective study. Prospective study means we do it in the clinic. Patient comes, gives consent, and we do it. So um, this was a study that we did, a prospective study in 2019. Um, it was, we called it optimal target identification by a modeling of erythrogenesis, abbreviates Optima for the optimal target. So that's, um, that's our approach. And let me, this is a video showing the distribution of scarring of fibrosis in one patient. So this guy had previous failed ablations, came for reablation, and uh, what we did is, um, this is one of his arrhythmias, you can see organization right here. So that's where we predicted we needs to be a blade. Here you can see, it wasn't just one, he had several locations. Um, this one is here also in the left atrium, there is an organization center here. Um, another patient, this is the only patient in the 10, 10 patient cohort that was a first time procedure. And you can see the distribution of fibrosis. This is where the wave is organized. It was just one recirculating wave, so it was one target only. And um, let me show you how it looks on the, in the clinic. So what they do is they see on the screen the location, and they come with the catheter, and what you, the dots here represent the location of the tip of the catheter. So the burn is around it. So basically they would burn, this is our target, and they would would do that. Um, so what are the advantages of using such an approach? 
Um, this is targeted ablation for these patients with the most difficult atrial arrhythmias, um, patients who have also atrial fibrosis, which is very prevalent, particularly as we age. And um, the final set of targets includes all possible locations where these are drivers can be. So the patient does not have to come back. Even if it reoccurs, we've already captured it before. So the hope is that this will decrease and eliminate um, redo procedures. And John mentioned that when he introduced me that um, the Food and Drug Administration in, in the U.S., this was a big deal. It, Seriously, I say it. It's really a big deal. They approved a um, 160 patients randomized clinical trial that we are now doing. Um, it's a, the trial is at Hopkins, and the patients are randomized to standard of care or our approach, the computational approach. And um, so, as I said, imaging is extremely important. And, you know, imaging can be, it's hard on the atria. So what I did basically, I hired the world's best expert on, it was really hard, but we brought him at Hopkins. So he's part now of my center and part of my clinical trial. And um, we've now they are 23 patients as of yesterday uh, we have enrolled. So it's progressing. I thought we would be further, but then COVID happened, you know, so they, there was no clinical research. But anyway, we are extremely excited about that. And we are hoping to, to demonstrate that the, the decision, what is the personalized approach to ablation, would work much better. So here are some of our patients in the clinical trial I wanted to show you. Another thing I wanted to share with you is, you know, as we progress, we made massive advances in the actual modeling. The first thing was that now we use artificial intelligence to segment the images uh, from the scans. You can see that it's not easy, but we developed this neural network to do the actual segmentation, so we don't have to have somebody go there and like outline the distribution of fibrosis. And then we have now this huge database where we like collect all the data from all the simulations because you repeat it to see whether they are the targets. And our hope is, of course, to later use that to do um, like a machine learning approach to do all this kind of trying to find the driver in a more automatic way. So uh, we are. Um, moving in that direction. And in the last, um, I think there are three, four slides, what I wanted to show you is we are also doing similar prediction of where to ablate in ventricular, in the little arrhythmias for, the, uh, for that. And um, this is based also on a study that we called BAT, virtual heart arrhythmia ablation targeting. And it's very similar to the atrial arrhythmias. Um, the same way you reconstruct the distribution of the scar, you do the simulation, you predict where to ablate, and then you repeat it. And um, for the ventricles, um, we actually managed to even incorporate it in the, uh, the current clinical uh, workflow. We did some prospective patients, and um, this is more difficult for the FDA to approve because those are little arrhythmias, right? So. I wanted, we did five prospective patients, but I want to show you one patient just that, that kind of brings it home what the technology does. So this is a simulation. We are blind. This is a retrospective. The patient was done already, ablated. And all what we received is the images. And then we predicted in this patient there are three places that needs to be ablated. That's our prediction. And then we looked at the data, and this is the first ablation of the patient. He came. And this is a location. So this is, so this is exactly from the machine that navigates the catheter. Um, so the patient was ablated right here where we, we predicted at the same place. This is kind of shown on the inside of the wall. It's exactly the same location. But also notice how much more they ablated than what we predicted. So each of these dots is the tip of the catheter, and there is a lesion around it. Uh, so the first is it's much bigger. The second, the patient went home. Seven months later, the patient comes back. That's where the patient was ablated. Look at that, exactly the places we predicted. So what that means is, if the patient would have been ablated where we predicted at the three locations, he, she, them wouldn't have come back, right? So that's what, what our approach is for, to be able to capture all that latent 
activity that may not be visible, but only you can play the scenario in the virtual heart to see that, and then um, we can really decrease the, the rehospitalization and redo of the procedure. So again, the advantage is it's a targeted strategy, much smaller ablations. It includes the response to the first ablation because you have lesions and fibrosis and now the wave is navigating all that. We incorporate all that and it's suitable for multiple imaging modalities and patient pathologies. So as we are doing that, we also developed a deep learning approach to segment the scar in these patients. So we don't do that by hand anymore. Um, so you can see another synergy of the two approaches. And currently, the, the FDA approved a 10 patient uh, pilot study. Um, what is important is nowadays, a lot of the patients who come to be uh, treated for ablation have implanted defibrillators. They've been previously implanted and patients don't want to have them. Um, so they, they just want to get ablated so they're done with the arrhythmia. Turns out scanning these patients with defibrillators, it's a huge problem because the device has a, a shadow on the, on the scan. So that's very, very difficult. So the MRI expert that I, I told you I hired, he finally developed a new sequence and technology that we can scan the patients that have implanted defibrillator in such a way that we can develop the model and do the personalized prediction. We are also working um, with a clinicians in St. Bart's Hospital in London, and we, in, we also have a clinical study there. We have done 17 patients, personalized prediction, they ablated them, um, and we continue the enrollment over there. So that's ongoing. Um, so this is pretty much my talk. I wanted to end with saying that the take home messages that from here are that combining personalized mechanistic computational modeling, which is the digital twin with artificial intelligence approaches really broadens the patient data input and really offers explainability to the algorithms because you, through the digital twin, you have the mechanistic side of the, of the disease and um, computational approaches and AI are poised to be a major tools in precision medicine and cardiology. And I want to end, um, you know, with the acknowledgement of all the members of my lab and the, my center and anybody who has participated. And of course, you need a lot of funding to do these studies, so I write a lot of grants. Um, and if you're interested, you can go to my lab's page. Um, you can see a lot of all the members of my team there. and. Um, um, you know, their description of some of the studies, and this is the center that I created from scratch because I wanted to bring together the engineering team together with the clinical team and radiology, all that I created this um, Alliance for Cardiovascular Diagnostic and Treatment Innovation, and you also can go to the webpage and see that. So thank you very much for your attention. My goodness, if you're not excited by personalized medicine and that doesn't get you there, I don't know what will. <laughs> it's just extraordinary the research Thank you've you. done, the Thank commitment you. you have, the disciplines you've brought together. I imagine even just getting them all coordinated to sing from the song, same song sheet was, was quite, a, quite an, an, an objective. Tell us what that was like. What was that journey like? Well, um, I talked at the lunch um, about that today. You know what I'm going to do? Can I sit? And talk I'll to join you. you. All right, let's do that. Uh, it, it's the hills. <laughs> right, so, um, yeah, so what John is asking is actually a really a key part of my journey because um, communication really matters. It's very, very difficult to get clinicians on board. Some of you might be engineers or might have tried collaborations. It isn't so simple. It is, you have to have a common language. You have to have, it, of course they want to collaborate, and you want to collaborate, but how do you speak the same language? How do you, how do you kind of meld the two teams together? And what I have done is, 
I made a really a commitment to that. When I say made a commitment, I may like really changed my lifestyle a little, well, significantly because I decided me and my team are gonna be part of the clinical decision, we're gonna be part of the clinical teams. So every week, I get up at like 5.30 or 6, twice a week to do clinical meetings. I am always there. It's been there for years. You know, I'm a night owl. I like get up at nine in the morning if I can. But for twice a week, I get up early and I go there and I am part of the clinical team and I listen and they talk to me. It's like this commitment to be, the clinicians are really busy. They have patients, you know, particularly interventional cardiology. They're in procedures, one patient after another. They just, you gotta, like, they have three minutes to listen to you. Really, you gotta slot in your ideas. So I've learned that, and they develop this trust in me and in my team. And um, also, another important part is to teach your students how to communicate. And I always talk about that, how I teach them to be bilingual, to teach, to speak engineering, and also to speak clinic. They speak clinic very well. And so the communication is not halfway. It's not they learn about us and we learn about the clinic. No, it's much closer to the clinical language because that's how it has to be. We are bringing engineering approaches in the clinic. We are working for the patient's health. So I believe the common language is closer to what the clinicians speak than, than what engineers speak. So I've worked very hard on this and I think you know, people have talked to me about what is my model for being so closely linked to the clinic. Um, and that's what enabled me to create this um, new center institute that brings everybody together. They were very happy to be part of it. I have more clinicians than engineers in the center that I direct. And it, it's just, um, I think it's a, it's a really amazing journey and an amazing enterprise right now. Very I remarkable, very it. remarkable. We, when we're talking about machine learning, mo most often people start to talk about big data. And then the moment you go into big data, we start to talk about bias. Right. Now, right. you've managed to avoid, by the sounds of it, good chunks of that by taking a rather novel approach. What was, the, was there an inspiration? Was there a necessity? What, what, like, what was the nature of that um, a, approach? So I'm going to answer your question in two parts. In the beginning of your uh, statement, you said, AI uses uh, big data. So I'm gonna say that with a caveat, you don't have to ha always use, learn from big data. You can see I didn't have huge cohorts, but we had a very smart algorithm, mm. right? So it isn't always, you know, you can take huge data and, you know, and throw, throw an algorithm and say, okay, go learn. But for us, First of all, we learn, we learn from raw imaging that has the scarring. We know what imaging is important, right? Also, um, you know, you figure out, when you combine it with the digital twin, for instance, we had only 45 uh, patients in the, in the um, sarcoidosis study, and we still were so much better. So it's a little bit, the big data is, yes, that's the simplest way, throw a lot of data and then learn from it. And that's not, it's always a problem because as you said, um, you know, access to data is becoming a very big problem in, in um, well, it is a big problem in artificial intelligence. How do we get to patient records and so forth? So if you can do technologies that are really good at smaller uh, cohorts, this is number one. And to answer your question about bias, um, you know, what, what John refers to bias is whether, you know, you have an equal representation of all, um, you know, genders and races in your data, so your algorithm is equitable, right? Everything is represented. Um, that is very important for general algorithms that work throughout society. For us, um, what, what we learn from our algorithms is data for patients that come to the hospital. What that means is if more men get ablation, the algorithm learns more from the data about the male, you know, hearts and ablation, but that actually reflects the true um, division between genders in terms of who comes to the hospital. So in a way, the approach is easier for me 
because those are the true patients that come to the hospital. It's not like you develop an algorithm for something that the entire population can use. These are only the patients who come to the clinic. So in this way, um, I'm really lucky, so I don't have to do, uh, you know, I cannot, I, I cannot enroll the same number of female and male patients because not, you know, not that many female patients come for ablation. So that's, that's how we, we go about that. Um, um, but you have to be very careful about, um, you know, bias and equitable representation in the data for anything that is generally applicable, um, you know, uh, in society. And I always give this example of, you know, how um, the medical research went about learning um, who gets, what are the symptoms for heart attack. For instance, they are very different in men and women, and all the research was done on men. And when women came to the hospital with heart attacks, they were turned back and sent home and died because their symptoms were so different, right? So the question is, when you want to learn something um, that you're going to apply in, in, the, in the clinic, on the, in the general population, really, the data has to incorporate um, every aspect of society. Thank you, thank you. It's one of the interesting, I'll choose a non-medical example. When they did crash test dummies, all the crash test dummies were based on male heights and weights. Yeah. And when they introduced women, none of the women were in the driver's seat when they did the data. So you can imagine what sort of uh, data you'd get from that in terms of experience, about where you put your, yeah. your airbags and, and how they, they use. And so you know, there's this unconscious thing going on that we've just got to be aware of, and I guess that's what we were sort of unpacking, but she's wonderfully navigated through that. I wanted to just, just you know, all thank Dr. Trianova for such a wonderful and insightful evening. You can't do any of that. All this special work and to bring out someone such so remarkable as Dr. Trianova without our sponsors. So I just wanted to acknowledge our sponsors. We've got two distinct sets I think were really, really important. The first one is our I'm going to call our new time, first time friends, the Neobionicas, the Epiminders, the FB Rice, Piper Alderman, Chatsworth Associates, Monash Tech School, Graham Clark Foundation, and the South Oakley College, all contributing this year for the very first time. I think it's so important to have new and friendly faces amongst the cohort, especially for important and uh, public discussions such as this, where we wouldn't really get an access to someone so remarkable. Uh, we also have a bunch of uh, returning sponsors, and I actually like to call them partners rather than sponsors, because they really understand the vision and mission of, of what we're about here and how we need to get these sorts of messages out there. They include the Bionics Institute, Club Melbourne, Phillips Ormond Fitzpatrick, St. Vincent's Hospital, Graham Clark Institute, Monash Biomedical Imaging, Cochlea, Deakin University, RMIT University, the Victorian Government, CSIRO, the Murdoch Children's Research Institute, and the Australian Regenerative Medicine Institute. Thank you for those returning partners. <laughs> And I'd like to also take one final opportunity to invite Dr. Robert Kulpax to the stage to do a, a closing remark as the CEO for Bionics Institute. On behalf of all of us here today and the sponsors that you heard John mention, can I say an enormous thank you to our, to our orator today for a truly wonderful presentation. What you provided was an incredible insight into the power of artificial intelligence and the, its ability to change the lives of people today and into the future. Normally, as you heard from the introduction before, Professor Graham Clark would be standing here formally thanking you. But as you also heard, COVID has prevented him from being here tonight. As CEO of the Bionics Institute, founded by Professor Clark 36 years ago, I'm honoured that he's actually asked me to pass on the following message to you. Dear Professor Trainova, I'm extremely disappointed to not be with you this evening. My family doctor has advised me, for medical reasons, not to attend the oration. I hope you will understand. I have been looking forward very much to your visit, as have my family, 
colleagues and friends. For us, it will be a memorable occasion. I hope too that you will find pleasure in the fact that you will have inspired us by our learning more about this new frontier in cardiology that you are pioneering. After graduating in medicine from the University of Sydney in 1958, I had a passion for cardiology that was nearly as strong as that for the treatment of deafness. I hope your visit will lead to collaboration in this great awakening of the importance of engineering, medicine and science working together for human welfare. Thank you, Graham. On behalf of all of us, I hope that you will accept this memento, and it's one of the biggest mementos I've ever seen, <laughs> and we gratefully acknowledge you as the 12th Graham Clark orator. So, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all very much. It's really a delight. I have to say, though, this will have to be shipped. <laughs> I came with a carry-on for this. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. The, the Convergen Science Network has in the past two orations supported the Youth Ambassador Program. The program is open to students across all secondary schools in Victoria who are selected on their communication skills in describing their passion for STEM and why interdisciplinary science is important to biomedical research. We've found two outstanding students who are fine representatives of STEM students across Victoria. So I'd like to invite Dr. Silvio Tizani, a director of the Convergence Science Network, to announce the 2022 Youth Ambassadors. Good evening. I'm delighted to be representing the Convergence Science Network, which created this initiative, as John says, to recognise outstanding young talent in science. The network has been engaging the public with advances in biomedical science for almost 14 years, and secondary school students and teachers have been a priority, and we are grateful for their support. It's also a reason why the network has, since the 2012 Graham Clark oration, invited students, our future research, healthcare and industry leaders, to have a presence at the oration and the oration dinner that follows. The number of candidates who were judged to be worthy of receiving this award this year was high. A just recognition of the quality and calibre of science students with passion, creativity and dedication, and dare I say, their teachers. I would now like to invite this year's Youth Ambassadors to come forward to accept their certificate and say a few words. Please give a warm welcome to Sophie Alexander of Gippsland Grammar in Sale and Ruby Weir Alarcon of Mount Erin College in Frankston. I'm Ruby from Mount Aaron College. And I'm Sophie from Gippsland Grammar. It is such an honour for the two of us to be the 2022 Youth Ambassadors for the Graham Clark Oration and get to speak to you all tonight. We both fully appreciate the magnitude of this opportunity as we come from schools quite far from the city where these opportunities are often limited. As women in STEM, we both found this event to be truly inspiring, as Dr. Treanova's work have revolutionised the way in which women are recognised in the biomedical engineering sector. By in being invited to the Women in STEM annual lunch, we were able to listen to many inspiring talks about the different journeys within the sector. The oration has opened our eyes to Dr. Treanova's groundbreaking work involving artificial intelligence which has the ability to predict a patient's risk of cardiac arrest. This will allow doctors to tell a treatment based on individual patient data and transform global medical care in a way that has never been explored before. 
I was amazed to learn that such an incredibly complex thing like the heart can be replicated using artificial intelligence and mathematical modeling. The ability to create a digital heart twin shows the great potential of biomedical engineering. I find Dr. Treanova's work to be entirely representative of the interdisciplinary nature of science as she relies on knowledge from many STEM fields to produce her work. A major takeaway from the lunch today was Dr. Treanova's attitude. If something is tearing or wearing you down, remember that feeling and rise above. At one point she said, I'm not going to be derailed. I have a goal and I'll show you. A statement which perfectly summarised a determined attitude in achieving one's dream, no matter what anyone tells you or tries to say, which really resonated with me. Dr. Treanova shared an anecdote with us about the way she dealt with rejections in her career. With every rejected proposal, both her and her team would paste it and face it on a wall they called the wall of shame. I found... I found this to be um, particularly inspiring as rather than focusing on the failures of the past, Dr. Treanova take, takes those failures and then f works out ways in which she can improve on them. It's been great to talk to scientists attending the events of today and hear their experiences which are all unique and different, which have been really helpful to, to, to us young STEM students who are currently studying STEM and will hopefully be future leaders in the STEM field. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Bionics Institute and the Convergence Science Networks for making this Graham Clark oration possible, and Dr. Treanova for sharing her experiences and her work with us here today. Thank you. I, I'm equally impressed by these two young ladies <laughs> because they were at the lunch this afternoon and they actually incorporated elements of that into this speech. So they wrote a speech this afternoon and practiced that. I think that was just wonderful. That was absolutely fantastic. Congratulations. I'm sure we're all looking forward to see what comes from your future careers in science. Good luck, ladies. The Graham Clark Foundation is again offering an award for secondary school in Victoria that has advanced STEM. This year, the, the foundation is offering a prize of $3,000 to the Graham Clark Award for STEM Innovation in Schools. Thank you to the foundation for this generous prize. I'd like to invite now Dr. Tian Q, a member of the Legislative Council representing the Minister for Innovation, Medical Research, and Digital Economy, the Honourable Dr. Yala Pulford and Mr. Grant Holly the chair of the Graham Clark Foundation to come forward. Thank you, John. Uh, before I begin, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we are gathering here today and pay respects to the elders past, present, and emerging. Uh, it's a great honor for me to be here today at the Graham Clark Oration, and also a great honor for me to represent the Honorable Jala Punford, the Minister for Innovation, Medical Research, and Digital Economy. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you and congratulate Graham Clark Foundation <clears throat> for making this award possible. I applaud the foundation focus on design thinking for this year's award. The world now, as we know, is filled with challenges and design thinking stimulates and encourages problem solving. This will be critical to our state of Victoria and also to Australia in developing a future workforce that is not only skilled, but also creative, innovative, and collaborative. Um, I also would like to thank uh, and congratulate uh, Professor Trainova uh, for her very inspiring, fascinating, and in her own words, uh, very awesome uh, piece of work that uh, her and her team, she and her team. Um, being a uh, theoretical and computational physics myself, I'm not stranger to computational simulation and modeling, but to see those applied to biomedical engineering is mind-blowing. And also the application of artificial, artificial intelligence, whether it is random forest feature selection or a um, neural network, very power-hungry, 
And I hope that we can use um, renewable energy source in the future just to, uh, to help <laughs> for the environment and our uh, future. Um, your talk is also very inspiring, and particularly for the STEM student. I'm an uh, inaugural Victorian ambassador for STEM education, and we are in need of students to participate in STEM, and also particularly the female leaders, because uh, science technology, as we know it, is very important in the time and age we live in. It's important for our economics, for our uh, competition in the world, and even for our technological sovereignty of this country. Um, so I encourage you and particularly congratulate the two girls just now for your uh, work and your commitment. Now, um, I would like to invite Mr. Grant Holy, the chair of the Graham Clark Foundation, to join me to make the presentation of the 2022 Graham Clark Award for STEM innovation and schools to, I hope the school are listening, <laughs> Preston High School. Wonderful. Preston High School received this award for its Da Vinci program. This program encourages students to integrate design thinking and collaborative problem solving in fields such as STEM. These skills are taught through using a design process to investigate, define, ideate, prototype, test and evaluate. The program culminates in an expo where all Year 7 students present their problems and pitch their solutions. Our judges were impressed to see the students tackle issues of waste caused by biomedical technologies such as rat tests and disposable masks. Congratulations Preston High School on achieving this wonderful award. So this brings us to the close of this year's Graham Clark oration and we've had the privilege of listening to one of the leaders driving a new frontier in the biomedical sciences, bioelectrical medicine and for sharing and, and inspiring us of the enormous potential this field has to the future of healthcare. We must thank our many sponsors who generally take, makes this event possible, and it's impressive to see such an array of organisations come together with the commitment to engage science with the community. Congratulations to those institutions involved, whose logos you see on the screen and behind me. Uh, please let us uh, share our support, uh, rec <laughs> recognition of their, of their contribution. A big thank you to the organisers of the Graham Clark Oration, the Convergence Science Network, for organising another successful engagement with the community and to the Bionics Institute for its support as the principal sponsor. A very special thank you has to go to the acknowledgement of Luan Ismail, who's delivered his 12th oration. Wherever he is. Um, an amazing achievement, something Melbourne has immensely benefited from. And we thank you, Luan, for your passion, your determination, your dedicated effort to all this, to bring together such an amazing event. And we can't now wait to, work, to see what you'll bring to deliver uh, as in your teenage years. <laughs> A finally huge thank to you, the audience, uh, for showing so much how much you care about the value and opportunity to hear from some of the world's best minds in biomedical research we hope you enjoyed the presentation, and we look forward to seeing you at a future Graham Clark oration. Thank you, and good evening. <laughs>